Okay. Hi, good morning to all. Hi, how are you? Doing well. I think we're doing well. Fantastic. Well, I think that the, the, the key thing to understand about, about what's happening with Italian banks is that um, the news of a possible bailout from the government, which is uh, talked about at uh, $15 billion, um, even the news about uh, Draghi playing with the yield curve as he did yesterday, uh, are no reason for, 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 for investors to get any bullish. Uh, the, 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 the problem of Italian banks is a massive uh, non performing loan portfolio. Uh, it exceeds 360 billion euros. Um, their entire market cap, if you pick uh, all the large uh, Italian banks, is a little bit higher than 70 billion. Um, it's not going to be solved uh, anytime soon without a radical capitalization uh, uh, program. Uh, and, and, and they're dragging their feet on it. Uh, this morning uh, we saw that the ECB was telling Monty Paschi and Siena that they uh, they they could not wait any longer, and that they cannot continue to kick the can further, thinking that uh, stocks will go up, and then they can uh, do the massive capital increase that everybody knows that they need to do anyhow. <laughs> so, uh, so I would be very very cautious. Yes. Yeah, that uh, uh, a a radical recap. That's a good title, yeah. maybe. A radical recap. Yeah. How do you like? How would you do it? If you could actually execute this properly, or is it mathematically impossible uh, given market conditions? Well, uh, given market conditions, you can't do it. You can't do it in a, in a, a let's say in what uh, the the European financial sector tends to talk about orderly fashion. Orderly fashion doesn't happen here. Uh, <laughs> so well, <laughs> so w- w- what needs to happen first is they need to create a bad bank. They need to create a bad bank that at least shields uh, uh, the good assets of, of the Italian banks from, from the rot coming from, the, uh, from this uh, increase in exposure to, to, to both real estate and and uh, non-performing loans from uh, semi-state-owned companies and 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 poor-performing companies. So they need to create this bad bank first. They need to capitalize it uh, with a uh, with a with a promise of divestments that come back to investors uh, as dividends. Mm-hmm. So you know, sort of like an MLP type of uh, of situation. Now there is a legal problem in in, in in Italy about doing that because it's a very very complicated. Uh, uh, ownership structure of loans and assets, uh, but 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 you know, uh, like anything that's that's legal can be changed uh, <laughs> if, if the government <laughs> if the government wants uh, wants to do it, and 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 it's important. Um, the second thing, obviously, is to do a capital increase. A capital increase in the in the in the uh, in the larger banks that that is that is recognizing uh, uh, the, the the weaknesses of a bank and that therefore is predicated on how to strengthen the balance sheet and it has to be uh, with a big cost cutting uh, program. It has to come with uh, a large and 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 uh, uh, aggressive uh, divestment uh, program uh, so that investment can be confident that this time will be the one in which you actually want to buy those stocks, want to participate in that, in those capital increases. So, uh, and, and there has to be a bond restructuring as well. Bondholders in these banks, uh, the secured portfolio, will have to uh, ac- accept uh, some form of, 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 of restructuring, maybe in the terms, maybe in the... Uh, uh, in duration, uh, but but uh, the, uh, you know those three things need to happen. Let's see, let's see how they decide to deal with it. It looks like they prefer to wait for it to become so challenging that it needs a public bailout. Mm. Yeah, and it, and and to your point, you I mean the law needs to change to have that happen in in, in at least the order uh, or disorderly fashion that you just outlined. Uh, I wonder on the Eurozone in particular, Josephine, if you don't mind showing slide, um, slide 83 here on the Eurozone, the demographic, the longer term problem here, Daniel, which you've done a tremendous job over the years. I think you were just named Spain's top economist. Congratulations on that. 
Um, Thank you. The, um, you. You've been well aware of this. Uh, this this is what I'm showing here. You, you can't see it, but I'm showing the you know the the demographic picture that is the eurozone, uh, which is predominantly a problem uh, in the south. Uh, eurozone 35 to 54 year old population growth, which has gone negative uh, in recent years, as you know. But now it's about to go really, 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 really negative. And um, you know, because what we're talking about, markets we're talking about this week are Italian banks. Uh, on the private sector side of deleveraging, this is an ongoing issue. Isn't this uh, one of the big tails wagging the dog uh, economically that isn't going away no matter what they do, recapping or reorging uh, these banks? And how would, you sh how would you agree or disagree or contextualize that uh, within the rest of the major countries uh, in Europe that you follow? Certainly. If, uh, the, the, the demographic problem in the European Union has a direct economic implication in the ballooning cost of pensions, uh, health care, you name it, uh, that, uh, and, and therefore in the ability of states to uh, reduce deficits and to uh, improve their, their, their economies. Uh, but, but it also has a tremendous impact on, on consumption patterns and demographics as you've seen, as we've all seen in Japan, um, uh, have a direct implication of how consumers behave. And no matter where interest rates are, no matter what liquidity you add to the market, consumers behave in a more, let's say, conservative fashion uh, as population uh, grows older. Um, in Europe, you have another uh, layer on top of demographics, which is overcapacity. Yep. The problem, of, the problem of Europe is not of lack of investment. Is the problem of Europe is of excess investment. In, 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 since the creation of the euro, it's been all about industrial plans, infrastructure. Uh, I mean, you name it. You travel all around Europe. You see these airports that, are, that look like the Death Star, uh, <laughs> and you go back. You go, yeah, you go back to you go back to the U.S. and you and, and then you, you wonder what's happened. No? Um, but but uh, so so overcapacity is a big issue. Demographics is a big issue. Those things, those two affect the first one to investment, the second to consumption. <laughs> but it also makes much more difficult the deleveraging, and it also makes much more difficult for banks to generate uh, healthy net income margins in an environment in which, at the same time, the, the European Central Bank is devaluing the currency and lowering interest rates. Exactly. So it, it, it all, yeah. it, it's so much like Japan, it's uncanny. Well, that, I mean, uh, it, it, unfortunately, it, it, without the productivity of Japan. If you, if you look at it, I mean, the, the most uncanny you know, chart, slide 84, Josephine, shows the same chart, Daniel, in Japan. You know, this yeah. is the point, like we're rate of change people here, obviously, and, and, and the rate of change in Japan, when, the, when that 35 to 54 year old population started to go really negative. I mean, it's, this is a very, you know, this is a very dangerous situation that's about to get more dangerous and the Eurozone looks very similar. The UK and the US do not look like that because they haven't, well, mm. in the UK, some, some would say, well, the immigration policy is gonna change, but the net net reality is that the UK and the US now potentially have rising currencies, rising interest yeah. rates, and, and an actual population growth curve that looks very different than Europe and Japan. Uh, do you agree with that? Exactly. Oh, completely, completely. I think that um, the, the, the trends are completely opposite in, in Europe and Japan relative to the UK and the US, and that adds to to, to, to the message that you were mentioning before, you, know, you have a, 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 a monetary and macroeconomic uh, current that is completely uh, opposite in terms of the strength in which, in which it's moving. Um, in the case of the, of the U.S., uh, you can see that, the, that in, in, in the behavior of consumers, uh, consumption growth has been the, 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 the main driver of the of the positives throughout uh, throughout all these years, uh, in the case of, of Europe, in the improvement of consumption is is actually uh, quite timid, huh? except in countries that actually went through a massive uh, collapse, like Spain or or, 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 or Portugal. Uh, actually, consumption patterns are, are quite weak. Um, so yes, you have a you have a, a, a you have. A, a, you have uh, a European Central Bank that is aiming to uh, uh, basically uh, try to try to uh, cover 
uh, the the impact of uh, macroeconomic forces that are much much larger than 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 uh, than obviously monetary forces uh, with monetary policy. So uh, trying to cover demographics, uh, overcapacity, and structural imbalances of of government spending with monetary policy well, ends up not providing a stronger economy, but uh, but actually a weaker economy yeah. because you perpetuate the problems. Well, it's interesting. I mean, that's that's the message. I, I, I'm, I'm so uh, surprised, actually, at this point that so many people don't get the message of Donald Trump and his victory, which was, again, yeah. an easy monetary policy, a devaluation of the U.S. dollar, a recession in all the states that he won, industrial manufacturing recession. Everything that you just said was happening in all the states that were, you know, Democrat states you know, that had overcapacity, they were undergoing some version of a structural deleveraging, and there was just a lot of political zeitgeist and angst associated with that. The problem with Europe is that they don't have Trump. I mean, what are they going to do? I mean, from what I can see, they have Draghi is going to be acting like Clinton was acting with, um, or Clinton or Obama was acting with Janet Yellen. Yeah, I think that the, the problem in Europe is that while the U.S. reacted to what uh, to the to the fake recovery uh, generated by by massive uh, monetary stimulus uh, with more supply side uh, economic expectations coming from somebody that was actually aiming to uh, throw all that to the bin or at least change it dramatically and come back to uh, putting more money in, in, in citizens' pockets rather than just, you know, demand-side economics. Uh, I think that what happens in Europe from a political perspective is that the, uh, the opposition to the status quo uh, uh, of, uh, in governments today is actually uh, aiming for more demand-side economics. Yeah. So the, 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 the National Front in France, Podemos in Spain, Cerita in Greece, uh, Cinque Stelle in, in, in Italy, uh, all these uh, movements that are appearing, some from the far right, some from the far left, all of them are looking, instead of uh, a, a change of economic policy that is more aimed towards job creation, enterprise, growth, and, and, and the middle class getting more money in its pockets, it is more about government intervention and, uh, and inflationary policies, actually, that's the, yep. uh, you, have, you have that prevailing. So, so unfortunately, that's the, that, that doesn't help in this trend that we're talking about, is that while um, the slowdown in economic growth in the U.S. that you so well pointed out month after month, in the in the last couple of years uh has been reversed by the view that lowering taxes uh changing uh the the, the economic policy is going to to recover uh, part of that 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 strength of the of the u.s economy with trump um in europe what you have is the opposite what you have is that those who don't uh, who, who criticize the, the the qe and the policies of governments are actually wanting uh more inflationary policies and more demand side uh stimulus hmm. it's um it's it's hard you know it's really hard for u.s investors uh to really wrap their head around both of those things i think i mean i saw you on twitter yesterday i see you every day on twitter but um and and thanks for being like one of the brave people that contributes you know in, in an intellectually honest way and objectively on Twitter, I think it, you're, you're educating a lot of people. But you're, you're back and forth with a lot of different people, as I've been. Uh, you did a better job than I did yesterday. You're very active on this. Uh, but you had a, it's a hard thing to explain to people uh, that the U.S. economy could be accelerating because, because some major, uh, major change has been undergone, at least in, initially here, from at a bare minimum an expectations perspective, um, may tack on, uh, tack on a couple good economic data points, but it's so hard for us to communicate that there actually has been something that changed in the U.S. that it's even harder to reiterate that it has not changed in Europe. I, I, I think this is a very difficult time to actually communicate to people what the hell it is that's going on. Do you think, do you think that's course. accurate? I, I completely agree. And the reason is because we have been told for, I mean, there's an entire generation of traders out there in the market 
that have only lived with uh, expansionary policies right. and with and with the with the view that central banks are going to create magic out of unicorns. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and, and unfortunately, uh, because it's based, you see, the problem that you and I face, Keith, is that we talk with facts. They talk with religion. Because when it doesn't work, they say it would have been worse if it hadn't been done. <laughs> when, 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 yeah. I mean, yesterday I was going through the numbers of the, of, of the ECB uh, results of, of, the, of QE, and you say, look, it's, it's, it's failure everywhere. So, and, and, and the only answer you get to that from Keynesian economists is it could have been worse. So it could have been worse <laughs> as, a, as a concept to me doesn't work. Uh, to me, what's important is that what we're seeing now and the reason why the market got so surprised after the Trump election is that strong, strong currency, more supply side, uh, lowering taxes, and therefore creates at least in principle exactly the same real effect but shorter term than what they expect to achieve in the longer term through demand side economics yeah because just think about it i, I don't know if it's going to happen obviously it's, it's still a promise but if uh trump lowers uh corporate tax to 17 percent and out of the 2.5 trillion dollars that u.s corporates have abroad he brings say 1.5 trillion, which is what uh, consensus estimating is possible. Uh, all of that is putting more money in, in uh, because, you know, the dollar rises, and obviously the dollar rises means that the middle class have more, uh, more opportunities, not only to consume, but also to get out of, uh, uh, of, of, of financial holes that they get into uh, from time to time. And the other thing is obviously the lower uh, corporate uh, taxes, and it's proven in numerous, numerous, numerous studies. Um, it has a direct impact on investment, on jobs, uh, etc. So I think that that uh, what we're seeing is uh, we're going to get, get you and I a lot of uh, uh, a lot of people denying uh, what will happen uh, if policies remain as they look to be aiming, uh, uh, denying what will happen, saying that it's a coincidence, that uh, it had nothing to do uh, with policies, because supply-side economics are, uh, are, uh, are completely uh, ignored right now by the academia. Hmm? Well, it's, I mean, supply-side economics were shunned by both Republicans and Democrats. Uh, Republicans exactly. and Democrats, as you know, went with de demand-side economics. That's why I've always... Uh, tried to say there was really no difference in the monetary policy of Bush and Obama. So you had 16 years of demand or QE based policy. And that's 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 a uh, that's an ideology or it's a mantra. Um, at the same yeah. time, you have supply side and, it, and whether or not it works, I think it's a, it's, it's a it's a responsible way to articulate it the way that you did. We'll see if it works. But the data dependence of it all is going to help reveal whether or not uh, it is working. There's a guy on Twitter that literally just tweeted me earlier today. You get these two, and I do read my, I, I do read, I, I think it's important to be questioned. I think it's important mm -hmm. to re respond. Uh, and the guy's question was, you know, what happened to your growth slowing mantra? I don't have a mantra. Like I don't have, I have a data dependent process. And that's the difference. Mm -hmm. I really do think that people, like you said, they talk in religious terms. They don't talk in terms of numbers. And if the data continues to accelerate and supply side economics is given some kind of a revival, that is nothing remotely close to what you and I were talking about before this, uh, this show, the macro tourism environment that we're in. I mean, the guy that's tweeting exactly. me, he runs stockmarketcaddy.com. I'm pretty sure that you and I have a little bit more bandwidth than he has. I'm not saying that he's bad at what he does, but if his goal is to do what, and I hope you're on this call, Stock Market Caddy, uh, is to educate and mentor investors on what's going on. Well, isn't that no, what we're trying I, to do here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but, but I, I, I think that what happens is that uh, people forget that, 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 uh, that cycles exist. But more importantly is that, as you said, I mean, growth slowing down is not even, is not even uh, that it was slowing down is not even uh, something to debate. It's a fact. Yeah. Remember that the Fed had to revise down uh, by half its growth expectations for the year. 
last year, and this is an, 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 and that we've had constant revisions uh, of GDP growth, of consumption, of uh, real disposable income, money velocity. All of those, all of those figures have been revised down in the last two years. Yeah, uh, slide, uh, slide 37, Josephine, while Daniel's talking about this, just so people can see, it's a fact. It's a fact. What I'm going to show here is it's basically... No one can say... No one can say that growth is slowing down. I mean, you, 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 Obama leaves office with the poorest uh, uh, record of, of growth uh, in, in, in ages, you know, in many, many, many years. But in any case, uh, after... But I also... There's, there's a concept that we as investors need to think about, especially when we're doing global macro, is we're talking here of return on invested capital. If you've spent... $24 trillion of fiscal and monetary stimulus, and you get 1.6, 2% economic growth, <laughs> my friend, if that is not economic slowing down, I don't know what you're talking about. Because remember <laughs> that remember that all, and I, and I, I always like you, like you do, I mean, I, 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 keep, I keep records of what people said uh, two years ago. I remember when people were saying the U.S. was going to grow at 4.2% this year. Yeah. 4.2, and we're talking half of it. So yes, growth slowing down. Now, the, the, what we're seeing in the, in the stock market today, and I think that that's what's puzzling many investors that want to believe in, in, in what is actually a mantra, which is, which is the power of central bank, the central plan growth, is that the market is responding to the, the, the impact on earnings of policy. Mm -hmm. The market is responding to the fact that if Trump lowers in, uh, uh, corporate taxes to 17%, the effect on EPS for most of the stocks in, 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 in the U.S. is going to be equivalent to what those stocks added to EPS from uh, 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 share buybacks and dividends in one year. Yeah, exactly. People, so I think this is a it, very basic math. I mean, I run it's, a, it's, a small business math. with. Um, basic math. I, I yeah. have a small business with eighty math. people in it. If I cut, you know, yeah. if the tax cuts come in and I don't grow at all, yeah. my ROI is going up. You know, if I grow exactly. thirty to fifty percent again and I get lower taxes, guess what I get to do? I get to hire more exactly. people and grow faster again. That's it's such exactly. a basic relationship that only people who have never run a business, which is effectively uh, the last 16 years of U.S. politicians and everyone in Europe at this point, uh, it's, mm -hmm. only, it's only they who would not understand that very basic math. <laughs> exactly, but, but I think that what's important for us as investors is to understand what is, what is driving stocks. One thing is that stocks uh, move up on the promise that demand-side policies will increase multiples, which right. is a very dangerous, was a very dangerous bet, and that's why you had to keep track of earnings and, uh, and estimates. But another completely different thing is, is, is what, a, what a numerical change into your corporate tax rate, or it is, it, it, it is exactly the same as widening margins, and you don't, and it's not increasing, uh, it's not an expectation of multiple uh, expansion. So, so I think it's just being, I think it's just being honest, not 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 saying that there is a mantra: growth slows and growth accelerates. And and cycles, by the way, uh, this is an important factor. Is precisely because we are in a in such a, in a extremely uh, indebted world, and uh, and with so many interconnecting factors, cycles are shorter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're cycles much shorter. Are, they're much shorter. That's why. Exactly. Um, you can show on slide five, Josephine, this chart that we always show our four quadrant uh, model, which you're familiar with, Daniel. It whips around so yep. much. I mean, you whip from, from growth accelerating to growth slowing to inflation accelerating to inflation slowing. That's, you know, th this is a lot of whip in that. And I think that that's frustrated a lot of people. Uh, all I've tried to do is evolve and change to adapt to the environment you're in. I mean, you and I have no business uh, predicting you know, the, the, the rise of the heavens and the flattening of the oceans. I mean, that's not... We're not in the business either of the mantra or ideology that central planning and, and demand-based QE economics can eliminate cycles. That's ridiculous. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's so ridiculous that you know you'd only you've only had to have Brexit, Trump, Italian referendum, and actually this is my last question for before we go to the queue. Um, a whole other host of of, of revolts and revolutions uh, votes 
to, to remind these political edifices that, that that didn't work. I mean, do you see, exactly. do, what, is, what are the next ones in Europe? How do you play, how do you play forward? Because I don't want our viewers or our uh, you know, institutional research subscribers to fall to the peril that is macro tourism. I don't want them mm -hmm. to show up two days before this next problem happens and short the lows in something again. Like what is the thing exactly. that's most obviously developing to you in Europe as a big forward-looking macro tourist event, I guess? I, I think it's obviously the French elections. I okay. think that you have, you have a, a, a tremendous uh, concern about the fact that uh, the National Front, the, the, the extreme right populists might win the elections in France. Uh, I think that that obviously leads uh, investors to be uh, probably rightly so uh, under uh, exposed to, to, to French uh, equities and definitely to uh, French state-owned or semi-state-owned entities like like uh, the, the utilities or some of the. So I think that 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 is clearly one area in which consensus is is being uh, clearly underweight. Uh, uh, underweight France is, is and the reason why, for example, uh, when anything moves in Europe, it's more uh, driven towards buying the DAX, which is sort of like a safe, uh, a safe uh, decision uh, to take action uh, in, 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 in European equities. Yeah. Uh, that's where the overweight is building, by the way. The overweight is building in Germany and the underweight is building in France. So that's what happens. I mean, when people, when the macro tourists eventually see the exhibit and they all crowd in and they fly into the place, it's always to the place that has the biggest political risk, whereas Germany's you know, political risks are, I, I, I imagine, the most relatively benign, I guess, is the... Exactly. Is the okay. Mm -hmm. yep. All right, yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get to questions here. First one for you, uh, Daniel. Uh, this is some, somewhat of a loaded question, but we can try and tackle it. <laughs> Uh, how systematically connected are the U.S. banks to a European bank crisis? It seems Greece, Spain, Italy all have collapsing banks and the U.S. hasn't blinked. You think, do you think that there would have been more contagion by now, or did you think there would have been more contagion by now? No, I think, I think that it's a big... There's, a, there's, there's a, a data point that very few people tend to take into account when talking about systematic crisis. In the U.S., the banking system uh, finances less than 20% of the real economy. Uh, in Europe, the banking system finances about 80% of the real economy. Wow. Therefore, what happens is that when you have a banking crisis in the U.S., it takes, I don't know how much time, but it doesn't necessarily permeate to the rest of the economy and the rest of the sectors, uh, at least in, a, in, a, in, in the midterm. Uh, in, in Europe, uh, a banking crisis uh, has uh, big uh, mid- and long-term implications on SMEs, on companies, on, on the way that the economy finances itself. So that's a big difference. I think that one of the things that we've learned from 2016 and from 2015 is that by now at least, when you have a banking crisis in a European country, it does not necessarily reflect on the rest because the, uh, the, 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 the interconnection between them uh, is, is not the way it was before and the, the dependence of each other. And obviously the European Central Bank uh, is helping in that front. But I think that the fact that if we had started this year saying in January, guys, we're going to have uh, a Portuguese banking crisis and an Italian banking crisis, you would just be uh, overwhelmed uh, <laughs> by the implications on the rest. It, it has actually been quite contained. And if there's one thing that I think that the European Union has done well is to uh, set the, the, the contagion uh, limits and to set the, the, uh, you know, uh, the risk systems to avoid massive contagion on a real scale. Yeah, and that, that has manifested into the show chart of the Euro, Josephine. Look at the, look at, exactly. you know, during this, pe this period of, it, this is classic um, socialization of risk or the socialization of local risks, is it not? I mean, the euro uh, going back in this chart, you know, it starts up at a, at a buck thirty-eight versus the dollar, uh, going back to twenty fourteen, of course. You know, this thing, this thing to me, Daniel, looks like hell, obviously. But what's most interesting to me is the last year and a half, where the euro's traded between one hundred five 
and 115. That's like a very tight range, 10 cents, two years. Uh, do you look at that, that, that currency as being the other side of this containment? Uh, that now the currency, could, if it breaks 105, to me, that's a very, very dangerous situation that people have not been um, forced to adjust to. I agree with that. I completely agree with that. And I think that that's one of the things that the European Central Bank is monitoring the most. And, and uh, I, I, uh, there's a reason why the European Central Bank, with, a, with an 80 billion asset purchase program per month, uh, has uh, 1 trillion euros of excess liquidity. Is mm -hmm. that uh, there is uh, obviously a, a a a devaluation process happening huh? that's 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 happening both from the uh, current account surplus uh, uh, is, is where it's manifesting uh, the most. Uh, but but I would agree that if it breaks that level, it certainly uh, is 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 one level to worry about. And I think that that's why Draghi is being so let's say. Um, aggressive about his messages of, of, of structural reforms, etc. Yep. Okay, thanks. Uh, next question for you, Daniel, on Italy specifically. Uh, first, wh uh, what's the urgency to bail out Monte de Pasci? And then uh, will the European stability mechanism step in to bail out Monte de Pasci and other Italian lenders? Hmm. I think that the, I mean, it is, it is truly urgent. It is truly urgent because there are other forces that are uh, eroding the capital base and the, and the profitability of the bank, which are uh, very low interest rates, very poor inflation, and weak, uh, weak uh, earnings in, in, in SMEs and in, uh, that are ba basically uh, most of the asset base of, of Monte Pasqui. So, so you, you don't only have to think of the non-performing loan uh, portfolio, which is ginormous, it's about 102% of its equity, but uh, on the other side, you have to think of the, of the quality side, which is also eroding uh, with, with such low interest rates. So the urgency is, uh, to me, is, 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 is un unequivocal, and I think that the ECB uh, is, is, is very clear at saying that they need to make this 5 billion capital increase no matter what. Uh, I think that uh, the European Union and the, uh, I mean, whatever is left of the Italian government, if there is any government, will try to uh, do anything they can to avoid a public bailout because because it's 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 supposed to be forbidden. Hmm? But um, public bailouts can also happen in the form of um, uh, a syndicated uh, uh, participation in the capital increase by corporates from a country, for example. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, it's uh, some sort of, uh, I don't know, democratic approach to, uh, uh, to saving the sinking ship. But, <laughs> it, but it is very urgent. It is very, very urgent. And I think that I don't know how, which form it will take. I definitely don't have a crystal ball in terms of politics in, uh, and in Italy, the world, at least of the, uh, of the countries where you can have it. But I think it is truly urgent, yes. Okay, n uh, next one. You mentioned the potential to create a, you know, this bad bank in Italy. <coughs> uh, the question in the queue is, how successful has been Spank's bad bank as an example for Italy? Um, there are two ways to look at how successful a bad bank is. One is obviously if taxpayers are getting uh, their money back and, are, uh, and, and if its, it's value or, uh, is, is, is going up as a, uh, uh, in order to, to, to sell that, 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 that stake. Uh, and the other is um, how quickly the financial system has restored its, its engine uh, once that bad bank has cre been created. In the case of Spain, from the taxpayer's perspective, it's obviously not yet uh, a success, neither in Ireland. Hmm? But from the perspective of getting the economy back on track, getting banks uh, to lend to SMEs and to families, getting um, the systemic risk out of the system, it has actually been a tremendous success. And I think that that's, that's how you have to look at it. Uh, and knowing that you know that in an environment of lowering interest rates and 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 low growth, uh, it's quite difficult that you're going to see uh, profits like, for example, uh, the U.S. got from the bailout uh, of the banks. No. Mm. 
That makes that makes a lot of sense. I think you've made a uh, a lot of sense, and thank you for that. Of, of, of what is a it's a complex situation, but you, you have an ability, this uncanny ability, Daniel, to uh, to simplify it, and I think that that's why you're getting the recognition that you're getting, and it's certainly uh, a, a privilege for us to work with you. Uh, I think that that's that to me is kind of the future state of certainly global macro research is that you know, we can't do this alone. I know I, our firm certainly can't. I mean, having um, somebody like you to collaborate with makes the world uh, at least a, a lot less tougher to uh, at least attempt to comprehend because that's our job at the end of the day. So um, um, thank you very much. I definitely appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure. Always great uh, to speak with you and to follow you guys because the research is absolutely exceptional. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that as well. And uh, to the rest of you, have yourself a good weekend. We'll uh, talk to you next time.